Welcome everyone. Here we are in the Zoom room again. And today I have with me Tom Thompson, who's the head guy at the Awakened Heart Center for Conscious Living, a meditation teacher and a counselor. And those of you who have been following my work know that ordinarily I tend to look askance on spiritual teaching with some exceptions. And Tom is one of those exceptions. He is a meditation teacher and uh, spiritual teacher, I would say is a fair term for it, who does not jump the shark into um, magical thinking, but who tries to see things as they are. Um, I asked Tom to be here today because I came across an article he'd written a couple of years ago that I found tremendously interesting uh, because it ties together some of the themes of depth psychology and psychotherapy uh, along with his experience of, of awakening from a kind of hypnotic trance. Uh, this article was tremendously interesting because uh, Tom started out by saying that he, as a child, was learning disabled and dyslexic. And it turns out that for him, instead of that being some kind of deficit, it turned out to be very good fortune. So um, with that as background, I'd like to turn it over to Tom and give him the opportunity to uh, clarify what he means by good fortune, if you will, Tom. Well, thank you, Robert. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for putting your book together. It's an amazing book, and I try to get everybody to read it, whether they, they're going to agree with it or not. They're things in the book that people really, if they're, if they're interested in sanity, they really need to consider. And I do recommend everybody read your book and consider it. And I'm also interested in how many people uh, project into your book things you're not saying. <laughs> and I find that interesting, but that's part of the process of cathecting is, is putting stuff there. Um, when I was young, I was learning disabled, dyslexic, I couldn't see very well, and I had uh, problems learning. I, I also don't have much of a memory, so I would learn something, then it would disappear. And so I went many, many years uh, assuming that everybody knew, and I didn't. And I, because of a somewhat difficult childhood, I was looking or what, what is life really about? Well, why are we here? What are we doing? And of course, there are all sorts of people with answers. I think part of my good fortune is the early part of my explanation, I got involved with science and science, true science, the scientific method teaches you how to look at things and examine them and question them and investigate. So I spent a number of years in my early teens studying plant cancer, uh, bacteria, fungus, all sorts of things. Um, and there were a number of scientists who were very kind to me and supplied me like with the plant cancer bacteria, agrobacterium tumefaciens and instruments and all sorts of things. I found scientists to be some of the most kind and open-minded and supported supportive people in my early teens. And then one uh, summer I was at my aunt's place in Lumberton, North Carolina. I was 15, I came up across a book on yoga. And the way this book was presented was it was presented very much like science, like evidence-based, you do this, and here's the results you get. And so there was a methodology with an outcome. And it talked about going to the source of life, where life came from, where, where it originated. And of course, that's what I was interested in, in studying plant cancer and things like that. So I immediately started practicing yoga, the postures, the breathing, the meditation, uh, visualizing Om, <laughs> as he chanted Om. I didn't know the Sanskrit then, so I visualized the English letters. 
and started doing yoga and of course made me feel better. Um, many years later, so I, I perceived yoga as a scientific methodology. And there wasn't, in the early books I was reading, there wasn't a lot of Indian philosophy or religion. So I had this view of yoga as a sort of scientific methodology. And then in 1971, I went and trained at a yoga ashram for six, uh, six weeks. And that's where I first ran right into the wall of cultural affectations. <laughs> it's just, it just blew my mind, the things people were believing and doing. And like I said, I felt inadequate. I felt like I didn't know anything. They must know. So I really was very open to it, but, but still the skeptic was there going, you've got to be kidding me. And so Ram Dass was coming on the scene then as Ram Dass, uh, big cultural shifts. And people were being initiated. They were getting new names, all of this. It's the first time I sat with groups chanting. And they're chanting all these mantras, all these bhajans. And nobody's asking what any of it means. And that troubled me because we're, you know, basically worshiping uh, Indian deities. And nobody seemed interested in why we were doing that and what it all meant. So I continued on because I had a very deep interest in Kundalini as the evolutionary power in humans. The theory of Kundalini is it's what made us upright animals and developed our brain, our capacity to be aware. And it's what is evolving us. It seems to be failing us right at this moment, but evolving us. So I went on, I studied a lot of Zen, studied a lot of things. I didn't make a differentiation between the yogic pathways and Buddhism because to me, Buddhism was a yogic pathway. And one of my Buddhist teachers wanted me to go to Japan and become a Buddhist priest. And again, fortunately, I didn't see myself doing that. She was, she was a very kind, supportive teacher. And she really wanted me to teach. She really, really asked me to teach. And, but I couldn't limit myself to a Buddhist context. There's a lot of incredible wisdom in Buddhism, but there's also a lot of magical thinking in the way it's presented now. So, the Theosophical Society, many other groups that influenced Buddhism and brought it into the new age in Hinduism and were, got involved in the ideas of reincarnation and all of these things. But if you go to the core of the real Hindu and Buddhist teachings, they're trying to get off the cycle of rebirth, not continue it, not be born in the next lifetime in better shape. So, so somehow uh, with the Theosophical Society and other influences that all got warped. Sort of New Age Buddhism, which was sort of the exact opposite of what the Buddha taught. So, um, you want me to continue? You're doing fine. You want to just continue? Uh, yeah, I'll go on a little longer. As I, I went and found a Kundalini guru. Uh, Swami Muktananda and I really committed to training and, and I still have friends, Swamis and uh, people were around him. Some of them are extraordinary people and they're still around. Uh, but what happened again is the cultural affectations and expectations and demands is there were truths there, but the focus wasn't necessarily on the truths as much as experience and worshiping the guru and, and again, getting deeply involved in the culture as if the culture were truth. It's a great article. I want everyone to read it. And I will put the, um, I will put the uh, URL in the descriptions. Thank you. On YouTube so that, you know, that will be seen. Um, 
it's really a very, it's a beautiful article. It's, it's, um, I really appreciate your sense of humor, Tom. It's, uh, runs through the article and it's just really superb. Um, Thank you. um, the idea that, that you affected everything except your wife. She's perfect. That, that, yeah. just, yes. Hopefully she's around hearing this right now. She's leaving. Well, that's actually the only, the only sane approach to marriage that I've ever found. <laughs> have to be, yeah. If you're not, yeah. a, if you're not a worshiper of, of the feminine in your wife, you're in serious trouble and you're married. You know? Right. Yes. Now, Bonnie's been uh, the kindest, most supportive person in my life. Yeah, well, I, feel, I, do worship her. I feel the same way about my dear Catania. Well, so, but one of the things I loved about the article was that you said, as a child, you were slow to speak. You were uh, learning disabled, as it would be called now. I don't know what they called it then, probably something less politically correct. Not, not being smart. <laughs> <laughs> My kid here is not really, he's <laughs> not all I, I hoped he would be. <laughs> so, well, so you, so you were learning disabled, dyslexic, poor memory, and uh, unhypnotizable, as you put it. Yeah. And you call that good fortune. I, I wish you clarify that for us, please. I'd love to hear that. Well, I, I didn't know what was going on, but um, for instance, there was a time where my mother had us go into church in Sunday school. And to me, all the stuff they were teaching there is just like going to a Walt Disney movie or, or reading Harry Potter or something. To me, they were interesting stories, some of them frightening. I mean, you know, nailing a guy up on a cross is kind of bizarre. But I never believed them. I never thought, like, and, and, and when I found out other people thought not only believed them, but this should be the foundation of my life. As a child, that was scary. Uh, I, I didn't know the words crazy or in a trance or anything like that, but, but I couldn't do what they were doing. Um, maybe because of the learning disability, but it was all still, it never became part of me. It never became real to me. And so it was somewhat startling when, when I found out it was very real for other people. Same thing uh, with Muktananda. People come back from going downtown and go, you know, it's so crowded downtown and I just, prayed to Baba, and there was a parking space right in front of the bank. And I'm sitting there going, <laughs> do they really think that Baba did that? And some of them did. You know, they, they really thought, and that's kind of uh, scary to me. Well, that's, that's evidence of, of a cult, a, a scribe. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I mean, good cult. It was a good cult for the most part, but it was without a doubt a cult. Well, that's, that's one of the problems with spirituality in general, in my view. There's an assumption that there's something good about it right off the bat, you see. So then, and, and there may be. I'm not right, right, right in the beginning, there may be, especially. So, but if we start out, just assuming that something is good simply because it uses language about compassion or, or universality or whatever the criterion is, then we never, then we are blind to the shadows. But every human endeavor has shadows. That's right. Yeah. Both of us are psychologists, so we understand very well that any attitude has the opposite lurking right there within its. Well, that's the, the yin and yang of it, if we want to look at yeah. it that way. There's yeah. no, the bigger the front, the bigger the back, as they say. So we're aware of that in our critique of spirituality. You and I both are. I think we share that view that adoration is not really um, the clearest way to, to view reality. Unless it's adoration for everything. Yes, if somebody can actually become that open-hearted, right? Then there are, we have adoration for our wives, but they're not 
a dangerous cult. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I've I've counseled countless cu couples. Um, I, I I don't know how many, 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 many. And what I see is the best possible occurrences take place when each person can see the um, impersonal beauty of the other one. If you can just see. If, if my wife can see in me not this guy who has a more or less acceptable face or whatever it is and all these, not that stuff, but looks into my eyes and sees what we might call intelligence. Right. I call it intelligence. It's a hard right. one nowadays because the left wing people don't like IQ and all that, but that's what we see in one another. We see the IQ. We see the intelligence quotient. We see the in one another. And I know this because I'm very close to three donkeys. I, I, I commune with them every day. I love that about you, Robert. I oh. love that. I love you have three donkeys. Well, they're, you know, they're the greatest teachers. They really are because they're, they are as sensitive as I am, maybe more. They're very easily startled and um, they are both they are prey animals in the in right. their ancestry, and they're very alert. Uh, and when you look in, when I look into their eyes, I see the intelligence, but it's not the same intelligence that I see in your eyes. So when I hear in spirituality, well, this is all one. Okay, <laughs> that's right. That's part of the story. And I think the thing that that I like about you and and um, Robert Hall and, and uh, Joan Tollefson, who are all spiritual teachers. These are people who do not say, here's the whole picture, I'm just going to show it to you. They say, as you say, there is something wide, very wide here, beyond our personal concerns, yes? Yeah, I, I think... There, there's a huge mystery and the human mind in terms of thinking cannot in any way really comprehend that. So we make up stories instead because it's scary. You know, when you, when you really uh, wake up and open, it's like, I love Joan's thing, uh, nothing to grasp. In the mind, that's all it wants to do. Here's an idea, here's a thought, here's the way it is, here's a theory. And you suddenly realize none of that is it. And so you're in this vast openness with nothing to grasp. And our mind, which is a survival mechanism, is terrified initially. Yes. In your, in your uh, piece on cathexis, you spoke about initially um, cathecting a guru who apparently had actual actual char charismatic powers. Right. And um, to the extent of spending an hour and a half in the morning chanting, um, obviously hypnotic induction uh, repetitive. Yes. Yeah, so chanting the idea that this particular old Indian man was somehow different from everyone else and was a messenger or embodied God or whatever. How right. I... So the confusing thing is things did go on around him. So cathecting on him was easy. And then, like I said in the article, you get up in the morning and you're, it's the, called the Guru Gita, the song to the guru. So you're sitting there with this book. I, people memorized. I couldn't, I mean, I'm looking at it going, oh my God, I couldn't even, you know. But people memorize. They sit there chanted from memory. And it's all about the glory of the guru. And the guru is greater than God because the guru can take you to God. And so the guru is the most important thing. Now they, they do say, certain things but basically what you're doing is you're reading this and there's the seat of the guru right up there in front of you and picture the guru's guru 
and people are believing the only chance they have of discovering their true nature is being in alignment with this guru. Okay, so there was, forgive me, go ahead. No, well, he, he had uh, extraordinary things going on around him, but he was a human vehicle for those things, but he was still, as many people found out later, very much a person. Well, that's, I think that's the, the point of view that I, that I bring to this party. <laughs> um, we're, all, we're all just human. This, yes. idea, this idea that there are these somehow special people who are endowed with um, non-human powers is an absurdity. I mean, just speaking honestly, there's a lot of interesting things happening around Robert these days also. Yeah. Yeah, right. Be careful. <laughs> well, so, but but so what? It, it's the same. It's the same as it always was. Robert has the same struggles that all of us human beings have, and right. those those don't go away. <laughs> That's not. You see, there's this idea, and I know you share this understanding with me, Tom. There's this idea that somehow if one could simply attain this, oh, and then everything's just wonderful. And that's not yeah, it. That'd be nice. Exactly. So, so let me go back into your story. You, here you are chanting bhajans every morning until you're sick of chanting. And then spending yeah. the rest oh, of Well, I was sick of it right, right away. I mean, this is not how I want to spend my... Right away, it's not what I wanted. I did it to achieve a goal, but I never bought into it. Mm -hmm. So what, what would you say the goal was? Again, the Kundalini at that point, that intelligence you were talking about, to me, you know, I use that Sanskrit word, but that's the Kundalini from my point of view. This person was a master of it. And so whatever his secrets were, and he was very kind to me. I wanted access to him. So I went through a lot of training. And as in any training, you know, psychotherapy, anything, you got to play the game. You got to, you know, there were very strict rules there. And you had to you know, attend programs, you had to take classes, you had to train. And I was willing to do all of that for two two summers to be there with him. And so I did a lot of things that I would not do ordinarily. Uh, so bef before, before going on with your story, uh, we've mentioned uh, the word cathexis several times. And I think I, uh, for people who are not familiar with that word, which really is not a common word, it's more of a uh, technical jargon in, in uh, psychology. Uh, what cathexis means is transferring one's um, emotional energy, might be called commonly, or, or uh, kundalini, or, or chi, or, or emotion, libido, sexuality. Yeah. That's what Freud called it, yeah. Yeah, it means to endow some object with this cathexis. In other words, in this theory, the cathexis is like a substance almost. It's, it's, a, it's like a ball of power <laughs> and you can project that into any object. Exactly. exactly. Right. So, so a common example is the American flag. Yeah, that's a great example. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I was born in New York, but I've lived outside the U.S now for um, a long time, 25 years. But what's going on in the US is madness. And not all the madness is Donald Trump. That's the problem. He's an easy villain. I mean, obvious, because he's horrible. He's just totally horrible. But, but now we, we're, we're projecting all of the badness onto this one character. And meanwhile, those of us who consider ourselves more rational or more sane or more loving or whatever, we, we're, we're um, avoiding seeing our own power games, our own desire right. to, to, to 
accumulate wealth and who cares about the environment as long as I've got my new car or whatever it is. That's not just Donald Trump. We human beings are in sad shape. And the problem with the U.S., from my point of view, as an as a expatriate, is that these, these Americans think that they're better than everyone else. That's the national, the right. national fantasy is American exceptionalism. And it's madness. There's nothing exceptional about you. You're just another human being. Right. Did you leave the U.S. and go to Baja on purpose to get out of the U.S.? Yes. Yes. I, it had been for years I'd really been wanting to get out of the U.S. Um, although I loved New Mexico. It's a beautiful place. But I, I'd, I'd seen the best of it, and I knew that. Um, just to give you one example, it was a beautiful, quiet valley when I first discovered it, and I fell in love. But 15 years later, the skies above this place were filled with jets mm. and their contrails, marring these amazing skies because the Air Force was training and using our... The, the entire country was being um, covered over with a network of control, command and control, and, and I saw it happening. And I didn't want to live that way. I didn't like it. So down here, it's very different. Good. That exists, but um, well, I don't want to get into politics. Not, I really, I opened the Zoom room to this to to get your story. So let's return to that. Um, I'm just I feeling. Understand what you did, Robert. But we'll go on. Yeah, I just wanted to get out of that and experience something completely different. And, and to, so to put the capper on that. I have learned so much from the Mexican people and my neighbors here. And I have no way of doing it. If I only could show the Americanos the, what, what a Mexican is really like, not this straw man that Donald Trump, because it's so sad that they believe that image. And it's so opposite to what Mexicans are really like. Sure. We bought this house. Um, we moved out of a military area and we bought this house and the people who painted it were Mexicans and because they had to travel a distance uh, be, this before we moved in we just said live in the house so three or four days they're just gonna live here and we figured if they could be in the house living here for three or four days and none of the neighbors complained or anything we were in the right neighborhood so they had a great time here they painted the outstanding job and none of the neighbors said do you know you know Mexicans in your house and stuff so it's a very eclectic neighborhood and, and uh, Ricardo said you know nobody hassled them or anything so that was a good test of the neighborhood yeah you just recently moved yes it was like last October year. yeah so let's return to your story as, as, sure. I, as I understand it here you are a young guy and you're under the influence of the master here, you are now convinced that he has something that you want to acquire. Right. And you're even, even to the extent of imagining that you will sit at his feet and then emerge as a teacher yourself of, of this knowledge that you hope to acquire. This is all kind of like, this is the path as you visualized it at the time. So right. if, if I have this right, I think I do. I love the article. Uh, if I have the spirit of it, then how does it happen that, that you're sitting here now with a totally open mind? I'd like to hear about that transition if you could, could go into it. Well, um, put in a few more details. I also studied with another Kundalini master and his, his, his successor is still alive. And, you know, I have nothing but love for these people in my heart. And in the 80s, we started a center in Connecticut where we taught all of this. And the guru wanted, you know, the gurus, some of the gurus came. So the center and other, other great teachers uh, came like Godavarima. And so uh, this, from the point of view of, offerings things were going on and we were teaching pretty much 
what we were taught. And it was, and, it, and the idea was to get people to believe it. And there is, for instance, you know, a lot of science, tons of scientific validity to, to meditation. But what happened in the center is there was still a part of me that was questioning. And I started a course called, a, it's sort of an arrogant title, but the Supreme Doctrine of Direct Recognition. And that course is more what you and I offer, that this is it, this is, this is it. It was based on the early Chinese Chan teachings. And it was a very different direction than what the rest of the center was doing. So people would get confused. They take some of my courses and I'm saying, if it's all God, what are we doing? You know, it's already happened. This is it. This is God, this, or whatever you want to call it. This already, this is it. And basically, we just, this, we are the now, we are the now. So anyway, I was teaching very different courses. And it was causing some conflict, and I'm supposed to be very loyal to the guru. And the problem was, Robert, I could only tell the truth based on my own experience. That was a problem. I'm really simple-minded, and after a while, all I could say is what I knew to be true, which wasn't much. And eventually what happened is I just woke up one morning, instead of being in the box, I was out, out of the box. And I could see everything I was doing as clearly as, you know, like you and I might study some religion somewhere else we never heard of you know, or, or archaeological study, anthropological study of the people. I was out of the box. When you, when you say suddenly you were out of the box, do you mean that it happened overnight? One, one day you were in the box and the next day you were out of the box? I'd say I was out of the box for a while, but there was nothing thinking about it. It, it had gone away. But I wasn't self-reflecting at that point. Uh, there was no sense of a, there was, there was experience in a cognitive center, but there was no reflecting back. So it was all, so I was living, life was happening. And then one day there was the reflecting back that uh, I don't believe in any of this anymore. So I don't know when they actually this sounds, you know, I don't know when it actually happened because I wasn't there when it did. That's right. No, I love that. I love that. That's, that's the phenomenology of it, I think, for all of us who awaken, if I can say that. You know, I like to avoid these words, but there's no way to describe yeah. it without you, this, right? Yeah. It, it's nothing you do. It's just right. something that, that's there. It always has been. And you've been you just never noticed it. That's how, that's the phenomenology of it. And then you did, suddenly you did notice it. Oh, that's my experience. Oh, oh wow, I see, I'm not doing any of this, is what it might be. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and it is like waking up. That's why this word's a good word besides all the others, because it is so similar to being enmeshed in a dream. And as a dream character, you're believing it and upset or excited or whatever and then you actually wake up and you see none of that in actuality happen it's it's not your your identity as a dream character is gone yes so i think one of the th this isn't an explanation for all unknown events but i think a lot of what you were referring to as things happened around such and such a person, this charismatic person, well, things happen. My own experience is that since I'm not doing any of this, it's, things happen more freely. There's not this inept person trying to manage, you know, the person's out of his depth. That's right. When he stopped trying to manage all this shit, it, it suddenly was lubricated and could take right. yes freely. Yes, that, so that's a kind of freedom as part of this aliveness. It's here. Right. It, it existed long before any conditioning happened. As you pointed out in the article, 
it, there's chemical conditioning that takes place intrauterine. Uh, right. There's no arguing with that in DNA. I mean, you're going to get a person at, at birth with certain strengths and weaknesses and certain proclivities that other people don't have. My biggest critique of so-called non-duality is that so much of that dogma tries to either erase that or pretend that it never existed at all, which is just absurd. Any, any theory I say that does not take into everything into account, any theory that involves shoving anything under the rug, it's not happening, it's not, that's not a valid theory, it is not. So right. non-duality is a core theory. This does not mean that there is not some non-dual character to reality. I'm not saying that. There may very well be, but I'm saying right. that, that should not that should not influence one's approach to ordinary day-to-day -day affairs with other human beings. When it does, then we lose compassion. We just lose yes. it. Compassion depends upon taking this interchange here as real. Although both of us could easily critique the unreality of it, the emptiness of the self, and words don't really communicate, we could we could deconstruct it, Tom, if we wanted to, and make it, make it nihilistically. Yes, but yeah, it's still happening. And that's what I like about your work so much. It's humanistic in the best sense, in the best sense. And any spiritual teaching that does not have that in the forefront, I don't see the reason for it. What's the purpose of some teaching that does not honor our, our humanity, our personhood? Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the non-dual Shaiva teachings, but that's exactly what they do. They talk about moksha and uh, yoga and boga, moksha and something else. But it's it ought, this this is the expression. This what's happening now is the expression of total. It's all inclusive. That's the word that guru used or the translator used more than non-dual, it's all inclusive. It includes Robert and Tom having this conversation. Yeah. It includes all, people listening to it and being skeptical. All inclusive is a, is a good term, I like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think both you and I have at times said to other people, look, this is it, this is it this <laughs> right here now this is it right we you and i have both tried that one out actually doesn't work that well and one of the reasons that i say that i'm not a, i say i'm not a spiritual teacher and i really mean that i i don't mean that i that i don't address these issues i certainly do but i really have nothing to teach i have something to take away because i don't know how to teach someone the terror of the situation there's a terror of the there, terror? there is a, a, th what I call the terror of the situation. We're all in a terrifying situation as people. And since I'm not willing to erase that part, I, I, I'm a psychotherapist at heart. I like, I, I want people to be happy. Yes, I want them to, to um, be functional, if not happy, at least functioning. Yeah. And so, yeah, functioning, fun functioning well does lead to happiness, and, and we have to be very clear of our intent. But, but being able to function well makes life easier. Okay, so go back to your story. You're, in, you're enmeshed in, in this worldview, and then? It went away, just like a dream. So I'm going to skip ahead a number of years. That's okay. So I, I left Connecticut, moved to North Carolina. Bonnie and I are together. We started a center in North Carolina. It was a very different type of center because it was more asking, what I wanted to do is ask good questions, not give answers. Teach people how to investigate, you know, more of the scientific process. You know, how do you know something's true? What's your criteria? So one of the great tantric masters, Abhivana Gupta, said, 
discernment is the highest yoga and the fastest path to enlightenment. That's, that's an incredible statement. Discernment is the highest yoga and the fastest path to enlightenment. Now, you, you don't see that a lot. <laughs> discrimination. Yes, perfect. perfect. Discernment is the highest yoga and the fastest path to enlightenment. Perfect. Yeah, and, this, and, and that, that's just really an incredibly beautiful statement. So we started a center and we taught all sorts of different things to help people be happier, more functional. I mean, you know, a lot of the things I learned are skillful and effective ways to help people organize their lives so they're happier and more effective. And when people come to me privately, it's what they want, not what I want. They're, it's their agenda. For instance, if somebody comes to me to stop smoking, I'm not going to be talking about what we're talking about. But sometimes it comes up. But what happened is around 19, 2001, we invited a character out named Wayne Lickerman. I don't know if you're familiar with Wayne. I saw, I saw a video of, of Wayne once. Um, I guess he was an alcoholic and, and drug addict. Drug addict, yes, and and I liar, saw, cheat. Saw, saw the light. That's what I got from Wayne Lickerman. Good name. Good name for him, by the way. Yeah, his guru Ramesh Balsakar used to point that out all the time. <laughs> yeah. Wayne, Wayne, when Wayne came out here, we had rented a theater downtown Southern Pines. The and and Wayne. Uh, drove away a large part of my students because he didn't put up with any new age bullshit and belief systems. And one of the things Wayne kept pointing out is we're not the doer, or, or he would say, we're not the author. We do stuff, no doubt about it. You know, we do things, we have preferences. We, to some degree, can predict what's going to happen, but not really. So I knew intellectually they were not the doer because you know the Bhagavad Gita says that all these scriptures say that so you read them enough and you oh yeah you know Krishna does everything I'm not the doer but Wayne said and this this really produced a huge satori that has never shifted back and it's a really dumb thing because I'm in a room full of people who come to our center and Wayne's there blabbing on and he said if you were really in charge of your life, wouldn't you be doing a better job? Wouldn't you always be happy, fulfilled, healthy, successful? Wouldn't you? And of course, the answer is yes. If I was really in charge of my life, my life would be different. Everybody's life. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be going to psychotherapists and stuff. But we're not in charge of our life. And we're being lived. And we all have, like you mentioned earlier, different genetic dispositions, different characterological things. They're, they're, they're things, some people can run faster than you and I could even dream of, even if we train very hard, because that's the way they're built. But you can have an eye for photography that probably I couldn't be trained into. I might be able to train to be a photographer, but I may never have that artistic eye because that's for whatever reasons what you have and so if we're really 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 honest we see that even though we can make choices because people get very upset when you say you can't make choices and even though we do a lot of things we're not the author you know you and I are sitting here bleed breathing but neither one of us are sitting there doing it it's happening Hearing's happening, scenes happening. Um, the miracle of the internet is happening. We're not doing it. Why do humans develop in a way that we end up creating the internet? So one end of the spectrum that you've now laid out is that through adoration, of the guru as a embodiment of God or oneness. Which you are too. 
And I am too. Yes, except if you really were, you wouldn't be sitting there and listening to this guy. You'd be doing what you do. And that's... Right, well, that's what happened. Well, see, the way that, the way that I see this is humans are hierarchical creatures by, by genetic inclination, just like the other mammals to whom we are closely related. In every mammalian group, there will, will be a hierarchical order. It varies from species to species, but there always is one. There's an alpha male and an alpha female in a gorilla troop, for example, just for example. That cannot be taken away just by saying the word equality. It's, it's not like that. It's a much deeper, it's deeply engraved so that the guru takes on this entire weight of countless eons of authority figures and popes and kings and all the rest of this. And now this guy's sitting there in the doti or something, his bony chest, and you look at him and you project this entire mammalian structure onto this person. So that's cathexis of a, of right. a, massive, of a massive, that's a, that's a serious cathexis. Yeah. Right. So right. I, You're absolutely right. We're, we're not only are we trained into it, it, it's a genetic thing. It's hopeless. It's hopeless. I, I'm feeling this these days because my book <laughs> It's getting out there. It's spreading around the world. It's amazing because Robert Hall told me this. He said, oh, this book's going to be a classic. You may not be around to see it. It might take a while. So far, I'm around. I'm seeing the, be the beginnings. It's happened very fast, your book. It yes. One, didn't it come out and a half ago? Last February, February 2017 is when it was yeah. published. So it's a year and a half or whatever. Yeah, it seems to be spreading out there. So, so, so I'm really trying to get you, I'm trying to elicit how you escape from the cut. We're up to Wayne Lickerman, and then, and then what? Well, Wayne, Wayne uh, what I, what I, again, it was, it was a deep realization that I'm not authoring any of it. And because we're graced with a degree of awareness, we become aware of our capacities and our inabilities. You know, I know I can do some things well and not so good at other things. It's just, and I also see, like you said, and we see this in psychology, that we're prototypes. They're different human prototypes. Like you said, they're the alpha males. And once you understand alpha males, you know how they're going to behave. You can predict. It's not like, oh wow, I'm surprised by that. Uh, and you, once you look at different types of people, the, their behaviors are very predictable. And you talked about doing couples counseling. It's almost like watching the same video over and over again. I mean, the issues and problems most couples come in with, even though they think they're unique and the first people who ever had these issues, they're common. And when you sit with them, you and I know what the outcome is probably going to be, whether they stay married, get divorced. You know, sometimes a person will come in and open their heart and pour out to me. And the first thing I said is, you need to talk to a lawyer as soon as possible. <laughs> Humans like to think we're so special, but we're just like, like you said, any other animal. Yeah, my experience with couples counseling is like that. Usually in the first hour, I can have a pretty good idea of, of um, what to do next. Right. And quite often it was, my job now is to help these people separate as cleanly as they could possibly manage. Right. And then I, right. Would, then I would start individual counseling with the two of them. Um, I would say it we're done with couples counseling for a while. I want to see each one of you individually. And then I would try to wise them both up. This is a train wreck. Okay, we have to walk away from this as best we can, et cetera. It's pretty simple, yes? It's pretty simple. Yeah, but for them it's new. It's fresh and new. For us, it's like... Well, it's horribly painful. 
I mean, it, yeah, it hurts. divorce is a horribly painful um, occurrence for most of the people, unless somebody just, you know, if somebody's totally cold blooded, you know, one of the partners is in for the money or something. That, not to put, usually people have sexuality that they have shared and intimate moments and hopes and dreams and all the rest of it. And then all of that's going down the drain. Yeah. And unfortunately, often children that become power objects in the struggle. Absolutely. So, um, God, I'm glad to be retired from that work, Tom, to tell you the truth. I did a lot of it. And I learned I, I would never I would never trade that suffering because of the understanding that it really brought. As you say, I see myself in the same objective way. You know, this is a you're born and you didn't choose your brain or body. You did not. You didn't choose your IQ. You didn't choose your athletic ability, as you were alluding to. Yeah. No, that just comes upon you like fate. And I think what distinguishes someone who's awake to that understanding, you're really not proud of yourself or ashamed. It's a, it's a humbling experience. Yes, it's a total humiliation, but in a good way. The, yeah, it's freedom. The, yes, the humus is that's the Latin word for the earth. So humiliation means that you're brought out of the high chair and down onto the ground again. And that's, that, see, that's the most beautiful stance that a human can ever have. And this has been taught for centuries. I'm not saying anything. Yeah. Else. And that's the thing, is to find the honest, legitimate teachings and get them out of the cultural context. I mean, the early Zen teachings were perfect, you know, and, and other traditions. But to get them out of the cultural superstitions that's what's required well it's really i i find this really difficult i i was very influenced by um middle ages zen teachers like huang po you know people yeah. like, um and well, that, Kai was one that influenced me quite a bit who i'm sorry didn't hear Wang Kai. Wang Kai. Wang Kai. So, um and I think that there's great value in all of that. Yeah. But I see that at this point, historically, with technology, with the internet, with everything that's happened politically, all the rest of it, it's really hard to have any kind of conversation at all about these things anymore because it becomes there's always opposition and debate that arises. And I'm just personally, I guess it's because I'm 73 years old and I, I'm not fascinated by these topics any longer. I, I'm willing to discuss it, but it's not really what I think about all day. Um, I, I don't want to debate with anybody. I'm not, I'm not willing to actually. And that's what's happened for me in the last few months. I've had to kind of see a line being drawn internally that wasn't there before where i don't know if you understand that yeah i think the trick is to see whether somebody's sincerely looking and questioning or whether somebody just wants a debate and i don't i don't care at all if anybody accepts what we're talking about i don't care if anybody at all they can walk away it's fine with me but if somebody's sincerely interested, then I'm more happy to share. You said in your piece on cathexis, I realized that if something is true, I didn't have to believe in it because it's true. I only had to believe in things that weren't true because they are not true. I suddenly stopped believing in anything Suddenly, I spontaneously stopped pop, propping up all of my beliefs and philosophies. The bottom fell out. The entire universe as I had known it collapsed. Me as I had known me to be disappeared. The world stopped. Cathexis stopped. I think that's really beautiful. Thank you. As Cathexis ended, it was discovered 
that the one thing that had been affected the most was this idea and image of a separate and unique me. When cathexis ended, the experience of a separate me ended. The, this cathected me idea was the source of all other cathexis. When it is said that you create your own reality, I love this part, when it is said that you create your own reality, what is really being said is that the creative intelligence energy that has become identified with a me is now cathecting an entire universe to prop me up. When I give meaning and significance to something, it becomes the mirror that reflects meaning and significance back to me, my guru, my car, my religion, my country, my beliefs, my opinions, my experience, my husband or wife, it makes me appear more real. So I think that's really a, a wonderful analysis of this, of this jam that, in which we humans find ourselves. And then you say, when cathexis ends, all, all projected significance and meaning disappear. When this happens, if there is still some belief in a separate and unique me, existential despair arises. Uh-oh, if there is no significance and meaning in anything, what is the point of me? What is the purpose of my life? Who am I? How should I live my life? These are the existential questions of despair shouted out of the now apparently empty and meaningless box of me. And then you go on to say, at this point, a lucky me will now run right smack into an authentic spiritual teacher who will have the honor of delivering the coup de grace. Whack, it's over. So um, it's, a beautiful phenom it's a beautiful phenomenology, Tom, of, of awakening. It's, very, it's so accurate. I like that very much. I'm, it's valuable. This is a good, this is really a good piece. To repeat, I'm going to put the link in, in the description so people will read it. Um, so when you say you have, at this point, you may have the good fortune to run into an authentic spiritual teacher who delivers the coup de grace, just whack. Is, did that happen with you? Is that your experience? Well, I think Wayne Lookerman. So when he said, you're not, you're not doing this, you heard that, and that was the whack. Yeah, I'm not the author. If I was the author, I'd write a better book. Yeah. I'd be the hero. Okay, so the, I'd, I'd like to explore here the idea of authenticity, because um, I've managed to alienate a lot of people now in the spiritual teacher community. You've was, alienated some of my friends. Yeah, it was never my intention to to alienate anyone. <laughs> However, if I'm in the position of commenting on seriously on questions that are put to me, my obligation is not to make anyone feel good. It's just not it. Or to be inclusive in that sense of professional solidarity or whatever. I'm not part of that profession in the first place. I'm an independent actor. I am not a spiritual teacher. I don't want to be associated with that. I want to be free to critique politics, spirituality, or anything else that is put to me in a serious way. I'll comment on it. That's my obligation, or I'll shut up. Right, I think what you're doing, what people miss in what you're doing is you're saying, this is the way I see it. You're not saying this is the way it is. Yes, I'm going a little further than that, though, to be, to be fair to my critics. They do have a point, because I'm going a little further than that. What I'm saying is, I'm awake, and this right. is how I see things. So I am waving a, a flag of authority in a sense, and I really regret doing it. I, I, I hope people can understand that. It's not If there was some other way to get at this job, of, I guess, cultural criticism is what I would call it. 
I, I, there's no other way to go about it that I, could, that I have found. People uh, see awakeness as an achievement that puts the person who's awake above them, like you said, that hierarchical thing. And that's not at all what's experienced in awakeness. Not at all. It's, I, yeah. we're, we're equal to the drunk in the gutter. Yes. We're equal to everybody. Donald Trump, you know, we can't, on one level we can criticize him and say that, but on another level, there's nothing to be said uh, with anybody because everybody is doing what, fulfilling their function. We're all in the same boat. <laughs> and it's sinking. <laughs> We're all in the same boat. We are. Yes. And see, that's non-duality. Non-duality doesn't mean everything's leveled out and, and everyone is exactly the same. Right. Non-duality is what you said before. It's all inclusive. So right. I, Donald Trump, I cannot, I can't put Donald Trump in some other world because there is no right. other world. This is it. And everything right. that's here has to be here. Otherwise, it wouldn't be here. That seems so obvious. Isn't and Donald it? Trump is doing Donald Trump perfectly. That's what it is, really. I see it, I see it the same way. That he also happens to be clinically mentally ill. Right. And, and unfortunately has been given powers that even a sane, healthy intellect would have trouble fulfilling. Uh, it's an impossible job in, in a real sense. It is, it is, and anybody who wants it right there is, is admitting to an illness in well, a way. It, it, yes, I think that's true. You know, I really liked Obama as a, as a, as a person, and I liked a lot of his policies. But he, I, he was a bit pathologically narcissistic himself. It was just, he, he just uh, compensated for it in a very graceful way, which is he made jokes and And, and Clinton, Clinton was the same way, an amazing yeah. narcissist, but he had, but he wanted to be a great president. That's the thing with Obama and Clinton is their narcissism wanted them to be remembered as a great president. So that worked for him in a way. Yes, and that's a better agenda than I want to. I want to milk this job for every dollar that it's worth. <laughs> Suck everyone dry as long as I can. That's what we got going on now. It's really unfortunate, but that's the fact. So, and it, and it is part of the all inclusiveness. Yes, and it's also it's also not this kind of identity politics to, for me to be saying saying that. I I don't you know. I'm afraid that everything is just divided. This is what I was saying about spirit. The, okay, I was getting into this. So I seem to be a critique of the stagecraft of spiritual seeking and, and guru, guru um, worship. I see it's not, the, it's, not the, it's not the fact of hierarchy at all to which I object. I mean, after all, I'm claiming a certain place in a hierarchy myself. I have to be honest about that. I'm an author of a book that's now out there in the world, and so people will obviously see Robert as more of an expert than if I didn't have the book. There's no, this is automatic. There's no, we can't erase it. We can't erase it. And so, but so my, but my critique of spiritual teaching is not that there's a hierarchy at all. I get it that Adyashanti has some smarts and he knows what he's talking about to a certain degree. My, my objection to this whole thing is the marketing and stagecraft that has made this into a kind of rock star situation. This cuts the heart out of it entirely. And these, these, these old Zen guys you were you were mentioning, they never would have put up with that for a moment. If they right. needed to, they would have taken their pants down and taken a shit right in front of the entire assembled monkdom, if that's what it was necessary to show that they were human. Some of them did bizarre things like that. And and famous fails, you know, famous fails. So, you know, I all I can say to my critics is I have tried to be as honest, open as hum and human as I can about everything. I, I'm not lying. Right. If you don't like my criticism of Rupert or or whomever, I'm sorry. That's the way I see it. And it, 
it, I could be completely wrong. I could be completely mistaken. Maybe everything Rupert says is golden and someone will just write it all down and memorize it, chew it up and go, ah. see that could be spiritual teaching, but I don't think it is. I like the whack, <laughs> I like the whack version. And so this, that's what I say, it's the sword of Manjushri. It's not any animus for any person, place or, or thing, honestly. And what I like about you, what I like about Joan Tollefson, what I like about Robert Hall, is all of you people who are spiritual teachers and you know identify that way. You are the ones I know, and there's, there's some others, who do not claim any special powers. You're just not claiming that. And you understand, Tom, that when I say I'm awake, I'm not claiming any special powers at all. No, I know. I, yeah. It's, it's a natural state. I mean, everybody's awake at certain moments during the day, but then the conditioning comes in. Even, even you know, even spiritual conditioning, you have a, you're, you're totally present without a me being there. And then the conditioning comes in and goes, oh, I'm a Zen Buddhist, so I must have just had a Satori. And that means, and you're off and running. Yeah, so it's this constant commentary this is, yeah, what, yeah. this is what John Troy describes so beautifully. He says that it's like the sportscaster is up in the booth there watching the action on the field and commenting constantly on it and even getting excited, go, go, or whatever it is. But meanwhile, that, that voice up there has no influence whatsoever on what's taking, pla on what's taking place on the field. What's taking right. place on the field is the, is the reality and the description of it is one, this guy's version of Yes. Secondary, right, interpretation. And when that voice sometimes stops, there's nobody there to know it. There's just presence. There's just what's happening. And then that voice may come back in and say, oh, my God, I've spent, there's been half the day. It's been extraordinary. But I wasn't there. It was just happening. Okay, so this is really difficult. This is very difficult ground. It, it's easy to talk about, but there are many states of mind, like, like a, a good example is a fugue state, which in psychology, yeah. in psychology is a kind of hiatus or, or missing place where let's say you're driving along in Kansas and the road's completely flat. And the next thing that you know, you know, you, you cross the state line and you're headed from Milwaukee or something. This happens. That's a fugue state. And you're unaware of any of that time or anything you might have seen or heard during that time. That is not an awake state. That's a hypnotic right. trance of a certain kind. So my, right. my critique is not that there are not um, actual awakened visions or, or, or experiences. There are in a way, but the descriptions of them can't really refer to that. They, they make us conjure up something else so that when the, right. when the so-called enlightened person wants to talk about her experience or his experience, no one understands it. They might be tell, telling the truth about their actual experience, but it can't be understood by the ordinary intellect. It's just not they're not so what i'm saying and is that you and i and others have have had a certain um opening and that opening somehow remained open but you're not always aware of it but right. you don't actually ever forget it either it's 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 there yeah so I, one way i put it is we are the now it's not we're in the now, we are the now. We're never not now. Our, you, I don't like the word identity, but our identity is we are now. Nothing has not happened within us, the now. But mind comes and goes and everything comes and goes in the now, including the ideas of past and future. But, but we are now. We've never not been now. 
I love fugue states. So I worked on psych unit for 13 years and it just, that was a huge education. Uh, you, you, you mean observing people who are in a, a fugue state? Few, multiple personalities, bipolar, fascinating, uh, extraordinary genius, but, but you know, you 97% right isn't 100% right. So you could see some of these people in mania who are just having these incredible experiences, but then it, they thought it meant something about them. It's that that's uh, practically ubiquitous socially, except since we all share it to some degree, we write off a lot of it and don't see it for what it really is. But we're all walking around deluded. That's that's obvious. Yeah. Yes. So I mean, even even in a, in an atomic physics person who's, who's not spiritual at all will, will understand right away that we don't see reality. No one. This is a construction, and it's a construction that takes place before we are aware of constructing anything. And so. Exactly. Even, so, so the, the spiritual teachers um, who claim, who make claims, which you do not, but they're talking about something they remember, and now they keep taking it out and showing it to the folks, and it's shoddy goods, you know, it's just shoddy goods. You said now, so you said, well, yes, but I don't, personally don't know how to um, make someone see that. I, I'm more and more. I feel like my function is just to clear away some of the dead wood so that people can walk around and look at this shit. So you were mentioning. I wanted to comment on you on the Zen tradition. To me, that's about as clear as I have heard it stated. Um, Zen these, is Zen, but Zen has now become very institutionalized. It's hard. Well, Last great Zen master I knew was Tony Packer. Uh, yeah. And that's Joan Tolleson's teacher. Right, and Joan. I think Joan's an amazing Zen teacher. True oh, Zen. Oh, Joan, but I, Japanese Zen is totally institutionalized. It's, it's a cult like anything else. Yeah, of course. W once something gets to be religion, it's useless. It's, it's rendered useless. Yeah. Uh, the, the, that just doesn't work. There's too much stupidity involved. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is, this is, this is terrible. I not, won't make any, <laughs> any friends. This <laughs> oh, God. It's great. But it's honest. You know, I'm, I'm glad when I was in the cult that people said things like this to me because it made me go, what? And look, and it's like Wayne Lickerman. He scared the hell out of most of my students because he was telling the truth. And so a lot of them left, and a lot of them are still around and so thankful to Wayne. Yeah, so so he was he functioned for those people as a spiritual teacher. Yeah, he shot their beliefs and ideas, shot them dead, and, you know, said things like you're saying. So the, I, I, what I was going to get to is this: I think that obviously um, uh, institutionalized thought of any kind is is um, poisonous. Just poison. Dogma is poisonous. Dogma of any kind is poison. It's rat poison. If it, once you start eating it, it's pretty hard to stop, and you'll die like a rat. Sometimes you come across someone like uh, Alan Watts, who will say, "Wake up!" <laughs> and if you and and it will work. So it, and if if that happens, you're just very lucky. Uh, you because you didn't do that. See, you were you were you had eaten the rat poison. Not only that, you were saying, mm, this is good, give me more rat poison. That's my critique of, 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 of this spiritual teaching that has the Vedanta, the strain of spiritual teaching that's rooted in Vedanta is rat poison. Rat poison, in my humble opinion. In my Unless opinion. It's, it's a tool used by somebody who's truly awake. But yeah. then it's a tool, it's not a truth. The problem is that there, there have been people like that. There have been people who awakened within that tradition and even use the words of their background carefully. And I think Nazargadatta is a good example of that. The problem is 
that that vocabulary cannot penetrate the thick skulls of all these people who are sitting there at these darshans. And he even said that. He was asked, are people understanding? He said, no, I think one person got it, Maurice Finman, and that's it, nobody else got it. So the rest of these people who didn't get it, according to the guru, come back to California, and all they have to do is start talking, and they're in the lineage, and, and that, that, this is what I'm, what I'm saying, and this is nonsense. They, they, right, that's what I did for a while in the, in the 80s, is teaching stuff that was tradition that was not my true experience. Exactly. So, and then I you know, couldn't do that anymore. You're so fortunate. And in my, in my observation, there are very few people who call themselves spiritual teachers who are teaching on that basis. Very few. I look. Yeah. I look, but when I hear what's coming out of their mouths, I don't, I don't believe that that's their direct experience. I believe that they have an ideology or a dogma, right. and they right. have learned to just, they've learned to justify it in right. one way or another. Here's the evidence. Oh, you, you mentioned evidence. Evidence. Good, there's good evidence about uh, meditation. Yes, there really is. It causes changes in the brain that can be demonstrated. That's, but that's not really the point. If you want to have a calm brain or whatever, it might be good for you. But, that, but what's being claimed is not that. That's good. I mean, that's already good. What's being claimed is if you do this, you will come out on the other end in this awakened condition. And what my critique of that is, no, you won't, as long as you are following any procedure at all in order to become something in the future you are not in the awakened condition. And so as long as that goes on, you are here. Yes, that's a hard one for people to get because they'll see a story like yours. And I get this question all the time, Tom. They'll see a story like yours and they'll say, well, that wasn't a sudden awakening. He practiced, all, he chanted and he meditated. Right, right, right. right. And, it's, and that misses the point. Yes, that's what you awaken from. Just like in, in my case, right. I wasn't a spiritual religious person. I, I had rejected that background as a child. And I, I was an, a, a, a rational atheist when I was 15 years old. And I was pretty bright. I had read and all this. Um, that's what I awakened from. So it, I, see, I awakened from a whole different hypnotic trance, but it's the same, if it's hypnotic, it's hypnotic, and that's the, that's the right. And what you awaken into is not knowing. Yes, and it's fearful until you actually get the flavor of it. And as soon as you get a taste for the unknown, it's the best thing in the world. It's the greatest. Right, it's so relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I always say, too. Well, look, Tom, this has been great, Tom. I gotta go. I have another. Yeah, thing. I got to too. I've been watching oh, the clients. Clients coming up in half an hour. Yeah, I, I, I'm so um, grateful to you for um, engaging in this conversation. It's been really. Well, this is a pleasure, Robert. I hope we did what you wanted to do. And well, I, I think what I wanted to do was get this article of yours before whatever public I may possess at this well, point. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I wrote the. I think it was about 15 years ago, and it just flowed. I don't even, I read it, and it's like, oh, my God. Um, yeah, well, but I think it needed to get out there. Yeah, I like, I like what it says, and it's, it's humorous and well-written. It's got everything going for it. So, um, thank you. Thanks so much. We could do this again sometime. I'd love to. All Robert, right. have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.